uh, Martin Tick. Uh, he's a re research team leader at the Medical University of Vienna. And in his talk today, uh, he is discussing the potential of interleaved TMS fMRI to elucidate bold dose response relationships as a proxy for cortical excitability. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Annalisa. Um, I want to use this opportunity to introduce interleaved team SFRI as another way to read out uh, brain activation changes as they happen and therefore get an insight into the dose related relationship both at the cortical side and also in uh, remote network regions. First of all, I have nothing to disclose. My motivation is uh, purely based on the need to individualize um, treatment of depression. And it has been shown that neuroimaging informed choices actually did improve and continue to improve um, response rates. And therefore, I think um, TMS fMRI or interleaf TMS fMRI can play a large role in further um, individualizing the treatment because other excitability measures like the motor threshold introduced by ELISA or phosphine thresholds, they do actually not transfer too well between each other. That means an excitability measure obtained at one target does not really correlate too strongly with other excitability measures. Uh, the advantage of interleaf team SFMRI is based on two advantages. One, the fMRI advantage of uh, high spatial mapping capabilities and TMS uh, ability to precisely um, time the stimulation. Team SFMRI in a combined fashion then allows us to measure the local changes at the stimulation site and also at the whole brain network and to obtain uh, those response relationships. Uh, the basic principle is to just um, change the input to so the TMS dosage, and then you do repeated runs of EPI acquisitions, and you adjust the dose again or other parameters, and, and then you get like those response curves. There is also um, one disadvantage of um, interleaved TMS fMRI compared to other methods, such as those introduced by ELISA, which are electrical signals, because what we are actually reading out is the bold response, which is delayed by five seconds, and it likely sums up efferent and efferent signals, and it's hard to, to disentangle them. That's something to keep in mind, probably. As an outline for the rest of my talk, I will just uh, quickly introduce the technical setup and procedures that we use, and then we will delve into the factors that actually um, do influence that those results those response relationship, including um, the target specificity of the effects, as well as also sex differences in the dose response relationship. And finally, I will conclude with our chronometric interleaf team SFMRI setups capabilities to get an insight in how the, the when of stimulation matters, so how the current state of the participant brains also has an effect on the response that we get during stimulation. To combine TMS and fMRI simultaneously and map the direct cortical effects at the stimulation site, it's very important to get a good signal there. So modern setups, uh, such as the one that we used in Vienna, which is here on the left side, and also the one we currently develop at Stanford University, which is based on a um, wrap-around coil. Um, this is like the GEF coil. Um, and those both uh, actually have a really good signal because we place the TMS coil outside of the imaging coil, and therefore we have the imaging array much closer to our object of interest, which is the subject. Um, yeah. In order to avoid imaging artifacts during simulation, there are different approaches that we used in our experiments. In the first dose response experiments, we used the volume gap between slice acquisitions. So we would acquire like one whole brain EPI slice by slice. Then we introduced an acquisition gap of 320 milliseconds in here. And that allows us to place, for example, triplets of 10 hertz. And we can then, uh, before actually, um, triggering the stimulation, set the stimulation amplitude to different intensities, and that's what we did for 80, 90, 100, and 110% of the individual's motor threshold. Um, and yeah, we basically stimulate between volumes. And then another approach that is um, more relevant in the chronometric design, so if we want to implement clinical protocols inside the scanner, is um, EPI timing, um, EPI that actually triggers the stimulation to happen between the individual acquired slices. And in that case, the imaging um, repetition rate and other parameters actually also define the stimulation um, protocol, which means if I set the TR to one second and I acquire 10 imaging um, slices or using multiband factor of four, I can also get 40 slices to acquire whole brain uh, images at the same time. And then we have like 10 triggers and we have 10 times uh, the stimulation in there, which means this would result in 10 hertz stimulation. 
And using that um, protocol, we can actually stimulate with 10 hertz throughout the whole procedure without introducing any artifacts. And of course, this gives us a lot of flexibility. And using other uh, protocol parameters, you could also implement, for example, theta burst stimulation. That's something that's quite relevant if you want to get insights into clinical protocols. Um, the setup that we used for the dose response relationships is here um, in action. So you see the TMS call is on top of one of the radio frequency calls in which I stimulate through that seven channel receiver. We have another of this seven channel arrays on the control lateral side. We also use neural navigation inside the scanner to make sure that the subject is initially positioned uh, right, but also that during the whole procedure we simulate at the right stimulation target. And using this setup in our first Hello World experiment, so to say, uh, we acquired anatomic scans and a finger tapping run as a functional localizer. Then we placed the TMIS coil over the individual's motor cortex. We determined the motor threshold. And then using the setup that I've shown before, we uh, interleave TMS and fMRI, and we simulate in blocks of 10 seconds uh, with varying stimulation intensities. So 80, 90, 100, and 110% of the individual's uh, motor cortex. And what you can see here nicely on the motor cortex is first of all, we get a strong significant effect at our stimulation target, so on the left uh, motor cortex. And uh, also with increasing stimulation intensities, there is an increase in uh, bold amplitude. And importantly, for 100% uh, of the motor cortex, so also the intensity where you see a finger twitch, um, there we get for the first time the, the significantly, uh, yeah, I like a significant effect. And uh, yeah, this also nicely works in single subjects, so there's not too much variability in there. Um, but how does it look if we go beyond the motor cortex to investigate other targets that might be of interest, especially in depression treatment like the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex? So using a similar approach, um, we actually simulated again with 80 to 110%, but now on the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex of the subjects. And what you can see here is that, again, most subjects show with increasing intensities also an increase in uh, bold. But there are also some subjects who did not show any effect if stimulated um, below 100% um, of the motor threshold, or um, some only show an effect if stimulated at 110% of the motor threshold. So there's much more uh, variability um, compared to motor cortex um, activation. And um, within one subject, however, there is on the simulation side at least, there is quite some reliability of the dose response assessment. So that pattern that we obtain once, actually we can nicely reproduce for a second time. While on the control lateral side, it's normally not that um, homogeneous, or not that nicely reproducible. Um, we are also interested if this effect translates to other uh, regions of the brain, because the left dorsal prefrontal cortex is of course part of a whole brain network. And what we found here is that increasing doses do not only lead to increased bold response at the stimulation target, but also in many other regions of the whole brain network. That network also compares very nicely to those networks established by Mike Fox, Robin Cash, and uh, Shan Siddiqui or Chuck Lynch. Some of them might be in the audience. Um, and we, and this is the target that also um, is relevant for depression treatment. So this SGACC anticorrelation nicely matches actually with the activation changes we observe if we stimulate on left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And then the regions um, applying voxel-wise linear regression, we can identify those regions that show the most linear effects in terms of um, stimulation intensity. So the higher the stimulation intensity, the more bold response we would get there. And these regions, again, um, nicely um, include the subchannel ACC as the most relevant indirect uh, stimulation target, or also the target that is used for deep brain stimulation. And they include the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and other um, spot hubs of that network that um, stems somewhere around the SGACC anticorrelation. Um, in collaboration with Annalisa Schuller and Anna Gano from a cost action on peripartum depression. We were also interested in um, gender or sex effects. So what we did is we separated them now into two groups, in men and women. And what we see in general is that men, and this is preliminary results because we just based it on 22 subjects. So this is something to, to interpret this caution, of course. But we see in general that men do show a much more um, hom 
homogeneous uh, heterogeneous uh, response, so there's much more variability in there. Um, and women actually usually show a nice increase with increasing stimulation intensities, and for most of them, 100% of the stimulation intensity or even lower doses uh, already enough to get a bilateral response on BLBFC. Um, and if we look at the subcortical uh, target again, the subgeneral ACC, over men and women in a group analysis, we find like stronger engagement of the subgeneral ACC for stronger stimulation intensities. But if we do a separate analysis for men and women, we actually kind of see that most of these effects are again driven by women. And I think that's, that's something to, to explore further because the subgeneral ACC is such an important region and it also shows that intensity might matter and it might also be necessary to individualize that to specific patient populations or for sex differences, for example. Um, but stimulation intensity seems to be not the only factor that influences um, the response to stimulation. So in a recent study, uh, what we did, we were interested in if it matters when exactly a subject is stimulated or in other terms, um, how the current state of the brain of the participant influences their response to stimulation at the target. So uh, we used again a functional localizer with a standard uh, manufacturer's head coil. We acquired anatomical scans and resting state data. And then we used that resting state data to derive a target that's based on the SGACC anti-correlation. And we placed the team SFMI coil array um, exactly over that target. And then we stimulate during rest and also during two different task conditions. We use again a EPI that's based on a one second TR and that enables us to stimulate this 10 hertz um, and we can actually then precisely time the stimulation to happen exactly at those um, cognitive processes we are interested in. And that's what we did. So we stimulated first at rest and then during an MBAC task where in the zero back condition, the subjects are instructed to press a letter whenever, uh, to press a button whenever they see the letter X. And then in a two back condition, they uh, need to press the button when the letter they currently see matches the letter they saw two trials earlier. And then in both of those conditions, in zero back and two back, we have an effective and an ineffective timing condition. And for the effective timing condition, we wait, 300, we, we wait 150 milliseconds before we start with a triplet of 10 hertz stimulation because we want to make sure that the visual processing and the semantic processing of that letter has already been done and the subjects are really engaged in the cognitive um, process of interest and in the ineffective condition we stimulate 250 milliseconds later with triplets of 10 hertz again which means the last of these pulses falls already in the in the image um, presentation or in the letter presentation and the very important aspect here is that the subjects are not really aware of this manipulation so they can't really tell if they are stimulated a couple of milliseconds earlier or later but we can be sure that they were not able to process that letter so then looking at the contrast between effective and ineffective um, timing on exactly the same target, also two back versus zero back, we see that actually the differences um, in the, just in the timing parameter alone um, match with the depression circuit, the depression treatment circuit. So actually the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex shows a larger activation and the subchannel ACC shows a larger inhibition and that means that um, this might be quite promising because it means that we can actually individualize the treatment further by putting subjects in the right state right before a TMS pulse happening, is happening. Yeah, and I think this has also a clinical uh, value. Um, but to sum this all up, uh, Team SFMI can be used to explore all kinds of factors, the simulation side, the applied dose, as well as how individuals respond to it and how different patient groups, for example, or other populations respond differently. But uh, I think it's also important to note here that we only got a glimpse on what's really going on there because all of these param parameters are actually not independent from each other. And I think we need a much more complicated way, maybe using machine learning al algorithms and then testing all kinds of different parameters in one session to really find out what uh, combination of parameters gives us the perfect response uh, for each and every individual. Yeah, and with this, I want to thank you for your attention. And I want to thank my colleagues, both at the medical university, um, at my international collaboration partners. Yeah, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask.
Thank you very much, Martin. This was a very nice talk. So I see you have a lot of questions. So in the interest of time, I will ask you one question now, and we will discuss the remaining questions also for John uh, then after my talk. So the questions, the most, the question the most people were interested in is how does the static magnetic field of the scanner influence the TMS magnetic field? Yeah, there's, there's one aspect that's good to consider because of the strong magnetic field and the additional gradient that we have by the TMS pulse of the coil, uh, there's just much more movement because the, the two fields act against each other. So we have much stronger vibrations and this also is a little bit more unpleasant. Um, but then in terms of if, if the question is about inhomogeneities or so, uh, we actually don't have any, any problems with that because we have like those small acquisition gaps and the pulses that we use are biphasic. So they cancel each other out. Uh, so we are not worried about um, those effects. Okay, thank you, Martin. Yep.